Thank you for coming here. Um, so I know that we're all here to talk about the current exhibition, Pulp and Bind, which each of you, um, and how each of you relate to the subject. But I think we can start off with a bit more context, and I'm curious if each of you could briefly describe your studio practice before we dive into paper. I guess my studio practice um, focuses on two um, different things. One is um, handmade books that I make using um, paste paper that I make um, and um, some collage work into journals and photo albums that are um, really, I consider it a craft item. But, um, and then um, I have that and also uh, the coat paper work, which is um, usually based on my dreams, but other stories in my life as well. And it's usually, um, when I work on those pieces, it, I work over it over a period of time. It takes a long time and um, of designing it and then cutting it, whereas um, the book making, the journal making, um, is something I can just walk into my studio at any time and just start making. Um, and I like a, the balance of those two things, of like doing a piece that is more, uh, um, I guess more, has a more um, art face and one that is more um, rooted in craft. For my student practice, I just graduated from App State uh, last May. Um, so I'm just beginning my um, post-graduation uh, art journey, um, trying to find what studio space I can living at home. Um, in undergrad, I concentration, concentrated in ceramics, um, which has kind of transitioned into my paper craft work. Um, I experienced college during the pandemic period. So with the lack of studio space for ceramics and access to kilns or firings, um, I ended up doing a lot more paper work from my dorm room. Um, so a lot of my paper craft is inspired by uh, my identity and background as being um, an adopted uh, Asian American from China. Um, so I'm really interested in uh, looking at traditional Chinese porcelain vessel forms, um, and that's kind of uh, transitioned into my paper through the blue and white pattern make that I do um, using different origami techniques. You know, my practice came up through being a printmaker. That was my MFA was in printmaking, and um, I, it started as kind of wanting more control over the entire work that I wanted not only to work on the image, but I got more interested in the surface and the ground uh, and wanted to make, you know, I originally would just use like various uh, Asian papers in my work, but then I decided I wanted to kind of have a lot of control over the type of paper. So came as a printmaker, I got involved and I'll, um, reveal my age, but it was back when there were no paper making programs. Everybody was kind of self-taught and we were like using writ dyes to pigment and just anything, you know? And so we were kind of learning that way, teaching each other in university. Sometimes beaters would appear, but nobody really knew what they were doing. We put Elmert's glue in for a sizing. And then, you know, paper, and then, and then the paper industry started informing artists about better practice, but um, uh, so I have a paper studio, I just was kind of taking a few notes, that's partially outdoors, it's covered. So my personal practice, I make paper and teach workshops from early summer into the fall until it gets too cold and then I pack up the paper studio and I, I do have a print studio with a press and I don't really teach from that except on occasion for a very small group. And then I work on prints for the rest of the winter. And so it's a seasonal practice, but it suited me very well, you know, to, to work that way. I want to dive deeper into why each of you chose paper as one of your main mediums. Um, you know, you use a variety of strategies, but can you talk about your relationship with it as a medium what drew you to it initially, and how it's evolved over time? Well, I started my studio practice um, as a weaver, and this was in the late 70s 
toward the late 80s. Um, and, um, I, and then I went back to school to get my teaching certificate in MAT. And, and during that coursework, I took a painting class and um, just fell in love with painting um, and the immediacy of painting. Whereas, you know, with weaving, it's so labor intensive and, you know, you know, wind off your warts, you dye them, you thread the loom, you untangle the threads and all of this. Whereas um, when I started painting, it was just immediate and I'm just right there. And then if you didn't like something, you just cover it up with something else. And so um, I really love the process. Um, it was very joyful. I built it up with a lot of texture. But um, honestly, the paintings themselves were just barely okay. Um, they weren't that interesting. <laughs> and, um, and so I um, cut them up into strips and started weaving them. And, um, and from there, I just became more focused on paper. I just started collecting papers and, um, you know, making collage and collage along with my painting before I cut them up into strips. And, um, and somewhere along the way, well, for decades, I've kept a dream journal. So, and I started making journals. And so a class, um, I noticed a class at Asheville Bookworks um, by Gwen Dine on bookmaking um, and dream work. And so I signed up for that class, it's 2016, where we talked about and dialogued with our dreams for quite a while and then um, figured out ways to turn them into books. And everyone did their book in a different way. There were play books and fabric books and I just, sort of tried a bunch of different things to um, try to, um, including printmaking, to really tell my story effectively of my dreams. And just somehow landed, I don't even remember how, um, cut paper into these accordion books. I guess for me, my paper journey started out when I was a kid. Um, I was not raised culturally Asian. Um, in my family, so uh, when I was in elementary school, I was kind of interested in exploring more and learning about Asian culture, whether that was through art, through media, anything I could find. Um, so I found origami, um, some origami books from my school library in elementary school, and um, it was a craft that we would uh, do in, in art class in elementary, something easy, something accessible to, to young children. Um, and I started learning more about the technique of golden venture folding, which is a specific uh, type of origami. Um, and I played around with this folding technique, creating um, little animals or little flowers, um, creating my own patterns as a kid. Um, I didn't like just sticking with the origami pattern that was handed to you. Um, and I really liked making my own patterns. Um, so that was something I really enjoyed and had fun with. Uh, but I didn't take it very seriously other than like a small craft hobby I could do as a kid. Um, it wasn't until the pandemic during college that I ended up getting back into Golden Venture Folding, which has led to the series of paper vessels that I've made. Um, I took my first clay class over Zoom from my dorm room. Um, <laughs> it was an interesting experience. I laid out a tarp on my dorm room floor that I shared with my roommate. And I set up my laptop in front of me and had 100 pounds of clay stashed in the corner with all my clay tools. Um, so it was interesting sharing that space with her and having to navigate how to do clay from a small, small room. Um, but that led to my love for clay and has also again influenced the vessel forms that I really have come to enjoy, whether it's throwing on the wheel or hand building or making the of paper. So that transition uh, back into paper was primarily just because of the accessibility of the material and the tools that I was uh, made available to. I started paper actually doing cast paper into plaster molds of images. They were images I'd make in clay, make a plastic mold, and then from there um, 
uh, cast paper into it. So I was doing that a while, and then, then I was just making flat sheets, and it was like a lot of people trying to figure out what this material was capable of. I paved the plastic, I mean, not the plaster, the paper cast that came out of it. And, um, and a different, early on, like in the late 80s, I was making dimensional uh, paper 3D forms, but you know, I'm married to a sculptor. And it really dawned on me, like, I wasn't really addressing sculptural issues. It was like uh, I had two-dimensional images wrapping forms. So I kind of decided this really wasn't, you know, didn't really make real sense the way I was using paper. And so I just was making paper for prints and doing that for a number of years. And then I just kind of felt limited because I wanted to do less and less printmaking, but I couldn't get any specificity in the paper. I wasn't interested in pulp painting. And so, but I also was getting tired of how technical printmaking was. You know, I was an etcher and a lithographer. And so I decided I kind of wanted to dive into the kind of the looseness and the freedom that making paper gave me. Um, and it was about this time there was a show at Rutgers University at the Corcoran, and there were these new materials called formation aids, which allowed you to do very fine detailed work or very controlled work. And so I kind of abandoned print altogether. It was just making images entirely with pulp. But there were specific images. It wasn't very painterly. It was much more controlled. Anyway, so I did that, you know, five or so years, and then kind of found this middle ground where I came back and incorporated print again with the handmade paper, and you'll see that in my pieces down there. Maybe it appears that they're all printed, but there's a lot of those forms and parts of the drawings that are just handmade paper. I know all three of you have your own um, subjects that you like to really focus on, dreams and identity and, and memory, um, but do you ever find that the medium itself and how right that it's for manipulation becomes part of the subject? Like, as paper ever? grown into more than just the medium for you? Um, I think in my teaching practice, which I teach paper making at ASU, I um, really encourage um, students to um, let the paper speak, you know, either, um, you know, and, and really focus on the expressive qualities you need to handmade paper. But honestly, in my personal practice, um, I love beautiful papers, and I try to use beautiful papers, but I generally, I think most of the content and expression comes from the images that I put into it, although I think the quality of the paper is definitely a, a contributor to the look so, I guess, the overall um, feeling of the work. Um, I actually took paper making lessons. <laughs> <laughs> I was in my junior year, so it's an honor to be on the same yeah. panel with her right now. Um, for my work, I guess the paper I get is all recycled. Um, I'm really interested in how the paper kind of maintains and holds on to the history of where I got it from. So I've gotten a lot of paper, whether that's from classmates in, um, in college or my family collects paper for me sometimes. I uh, got a lot of paper from the recycling bins from the university library. Um, I'm really interested in how whenever I fold my um, paper pieces, you can still usually see some of the text that's written on it or some of the pictures that were printed on the paper. So I'm interested in the recycled nature of reusing paper. Um, again, it was an accessibility thing for me. Uh, if I'm reusing that type of printer paper, um, I'm not spending a whole lot of money on materials. Uh, the focus of my work is primarily in the, the labor and time that it takes to make each of my pieces. Um, all of the titles in my vessels are named after the number of individual modules that go into building it. Um, so those tend to range from, from four to 12,000 pieces, depending on how large that I'm building. Um, so the the history behind where I'm getting and sourcing my papers is um, an important part of my work. But also, I'm drawing upon um, the history of the Golden Venture folding itself. Um, I think some of it's written in my artist statement, but um, 
for a brief history, the golden venture folding technique that I utilize in my work um, comes from uh, when a freighter ship called the Golden Venture crashed outside of New York. Um, it was back in 1993, it held over 250 Chinese migrants that were coming over illegally to the US to find work or for other reasons. And when the ship ran aground, um, the migrants were rescued from the waters and then put into prisons for a period of time. Um, some of those prisoners uh, made these sculptural forms, whether it was images of um, the boat or images of freedom, such as the, the eagle. Um, the Museum of Chinese America in 2017 had an exhibition where they collected some of the paper pieces that these prisoners had made during their time. Um, and they were highlighting just the, the community aspect of the pieces that were made there, um, drawing notes on um, immigration and just Asian American history um, in that regard. Um, so I was doing my thesis work a lot on researching that part of history and where the, um, the techniques and methods that I draw from in my work, where that comes from. Um, and I was tying my own aspects of community and identity um, to create my own body of work in creating these um, paper vessels. So a lot of it has to do with the rich cultural history and ties back to my own um, personal identity. Um, so I think it kind of expands outside of just the, the paper aspect. You know, when um, I was first saw the question here, I thought, well, no, it doesn't really, it's, it's not the subject of my work, the paper, but, um, you know, because I work in a narrative uh, format and there's stories, there's dreams, there's memories that are the subject. But then I realized, like, what I've written before is that I've lied. <laughs> um, I thought, you know, one thing that I really like the juxtaposition of print and paper, paper I can make images that are soft and diffuse, uh, just like memory is, and then I use printmaking for more, like I said, more spe specificity. Uh, it's, it's just like memory is. Things, some things are clear and sharp and some things are vague. And I've kind of played on that more in recent years, like um, on those hidden ideas or subliminal things are the parts that are I make with the paper components. So it is part of the subject that dawned on me. It's so good to kind of see that question and make myself think about it. Rosa mentioned that uh, she's taught paper and uh, we will have the opportunity to take that. But my next question is for Georgia and for Rosa, you've both taught extensively in the field. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about the experience of teaching the really rich technical aspects of a very common medium that students probably have a lot of familiarity with, but probably don't know all of the opportunities it gives for art. Well, at the, the beginning of the class, we sort of have two different processes going on. One, um, learning um, you know, different variables and possibilities of handmade paper. But when students are pulling paper, they um, are making um, paper structures out of all sorts of paper, recycled paper. It, Aunt Leah uh, um, did some of her amazing work with um, margins in that class. But, um, and so what I encourage them, you know, as they're learning um, the potential of handmade paper and how and the expressive qualities of handmade paper, how to manipulate it, how to form, um, how to, you know, what inc different inclusions um, uh, work best and um, can really speak, you know, uh, the paper itself can really speak and express. Um, they're also taking sort of non-precious papers and um, forming them into structures um, that that totally you wouldn't normally think of as paper. They're not using paper as just a simple substrate for for applying um, drawing material or or from item to. Yeah. So, and as we go forward in the semester and are working exclusively with handmade paper, um, with the, we talk a lot about the potential of that paper and how to uh, communicate their content through the paper itself and not 
just entirely with value imagery. Amen. You know, I, I've taught, I think, 38 years in, in, in institutions, you know, universities, art schools, and, um, and I'm retired now, but still do workshops because I really love teaching. And I'm just still to this, and I think one of the things I love so much is this, you know, as a teacher, you have to stay open, or you should be staying open to what the student, the artist, uh, their ideas and what they bring to the table. And so I'm constantly surprised and challenged <laughs> by things that people come, you know, to my workshops today, but for all the years of, you know, I would have sculpture students or graphic designers who all had a different agenda of what they wanted from it. And then, and being challenged myself to learn how to help them and continually surprised I think so I would say like I don't think this is gonna work. <laughs> and then, you know, they any any of you who teach have seen this repeatedly that there's so much so many different ideas people bring to the table. It's the most exciting part to me about teaching. And uh, have just you know, seen things over the years that have been really exciting and changed my practice. You know, I see something and I go, Oh, that was clever, you know. <laughs> and so, um, uh, that's the part I've really enjoyed, why I continue to do workshop. Now that I don't have to deal with the bureaucracy, the grading, anything like that. I just have the people who want to be there, and it's kind of more fun than ever for me, you know. No committee meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious if you can expand on what you learned from students that changed your practice. Well, people who want to incorporate things, or uh, a lot of sculptural stuff, because they really don't do sculptural work, they wanted to build forms and have to kind of see. And I, I know like, you know, recipes for certain papers that do what their shrinkage is and how they are, are more likely to uh, have sculptural applications. But, um, you know, I had a painter who was taking workshops with me from all last summer, teaches at UNCA, who was pregnant, want to kind of get away from all the chemicals of painting and wanted to try and translate. And so she was showing me these paintings which are gorgeous and I really had to kind of think about this a lot, you know, about how you pigment, how you translate paper as glazing, you know, how you get transparent layering of paper the way you would with paint. And um, the only one I was really stuck was at Penland one year and I had this young student who said, I want to find the intersection of hand-blown glass and paper, you know. She had the whole, you know, she bang, and I want to incorporate this, and I want to incorporate that, you know. We used to have a joke at the court ring, and they'd say, like, my dream is to do this, and we'd say, take your dream and cut it in half, you know. <laughs> Let's start at this level, and then you build, you know. And so, I never really, I said, take another glass cat. We're doing paper in this course. <laughs> you can keep going up and talking to the people in glass, but I said, this is like, a whole ball of wax that a professional artist with many years of experience has to kind of address this. You know, you don't do this fresh out of the gate. I'm sure there's a way, but anyway. So it's always been really interesting to me to get, you know, those kinds of challenges um, with whatever people are coming into a workshop wanting to do. And then Lila, I have a question for you. So unlike many of the artists in the exhibition, your work is not pictorially oriented. Uh, how do you understand paper as a sculpture medium? You've kind of covered it a little bit, but if you can dive in deeper, and then can you talk about your vessels and why it matters that they're made with paper rather than the other materials that we normally associate with the forms? For me, um, well, I'll answer the last question first. <laughs> um, I think it's important for me that they're made out of paper. Uh, I really like the aspect of you see it once and it it interests you when you see it in the gallery, but when you look at it again, you have to go closer to see uh, more of the detail to really be able to tell what it's made out of. Um, I think it's kind of fun fooling people sometimes when they don't realize my work is made out of paper. Um, a lot of people, when they see images of my work, think it's just automatically ceramics. Uh, but when you do look closer, you can see all of the individual modules that make up the total vessel piece. And I really love that aspect of working. Uh, modulating. Um, I think working in the 3D form, sculpturally, um, has always been something that I've been more drawn to. 
Um, most of my work has not been focused on two-dimensional stuff. Um, I really am interested in how um, taking a, a 2D sketch from a sketchbook can come to life um, in the, the sculptural. Um, I really like thinking of how large I'm going to build, how the paper is going to bend to form the walls of the vessel that I want to make. Um, it's something that really drew me to uh, clay throwing in the first place. Um, I was really interested in the functionality of um, ceramics and throwing on the wheel, uh, being able to use the art pieces that I'm making. Um, it doesn't quite translate to my paperwork now. Um, the paper vessels I make are not quite as functional in the same way that ceramics might be. You can't quite put uh, water and flowers into them. Um, but I, the other part of building sculpturally that I like is, and modularly, um, is that I don't tend to use adhesives or glue in my pieces. Um, the tension between the paper pieces themselves um, holds them together. Um, and I build in multiple parts that stack on each other. Um, so if I start building a piece and I'm not happy with the way that the walls are forming or that the shape is curving in or bending out, uh, I can just take it apart. <laughs> I always end up um, not quite satisfied with um, how a piece is going and I'm able to just go back like you would um, if you were knitting or crocheting a piece. You kind of just unravel it. And um, I have seen a lot of people comment about how my work is so similar to knitting or weaving and creating the, um, the patterning on the vessels as well as the, um, how it's built. You, you mentioned earlier that your work is inspired by porcelain and the blue specifically, and you have a very specific shade of blue that is in all of your pieces, and I know that they're recycled paper, and I'm curious how do you find the blue pieces that shade? Most of the blue that's currently in the downstairs exhibition, I actually got from a friend in college. Um, they gave me a huge stack of leftover blue paper from voter registration one year. Um, <laughs> so that's where a lot of that light blue color from, um, comes from. Um, personally, for my own color palette, I am naturally drawn to more pastels. So while I still wanted to maintain that um, connection to the, the typical like, dark royal blue that's associated with the blue and white porcelain pieces, um, I added a little bit of my own color into the work by making it a little bit lighter and more pastel. Um, I do experiment with some other colors of blue, like right now I'm working um, with this more aqua shade. Um, it's kind of just whatever paper I have accessible to me in large um, <coughs> quantities. Um, but I did, I've been folding. I hope it hasn't been too distracting for people up here. Um, but if you would like to come over and see some of the individual module pieces after the artist talk, you're more than welcome to touch a few and play around with them. I don't want to give short shrift to um, the other sort of element of this exhibition, which is book. And I actually think there's a strong, you know, we've been focusing on paper, but there's something to be said about um, the book as a form and an approach to paper that I kind of can see in all of your work. Um, I think, you know, at its simplest, in some ways, when you think of book, you're thinking of paper translated into a structural medium. How do we organize paper? How do we structure paper? I mean, Rosa, your, um, your cutouts, I mean, they are so, so seemingly simple, but structurally to make them sound, I think is perhaps one of your biggest challenges. I mean, I spent a lot of time in the gallery working to make them stand just so, and they do somehow. And then, I mean, I think the structural nature of your work, Leela, it's, I think, clear to anyone who looks at it. And in some ways, you know, a book is not necessarily, you know, a narrative form, and most often is, but I think there is um, a way to read your vessels um, as a series of pages, this sort of this larger structure that, you know, like any vessel, is, is holding some sort of content. Yours may not be liquid, um, but it's certainly meaning, and it, you know, relates to identity and the history of these technical approaches and form. And then, um, Georgia, I think, you know, you were layering two sort of parallel techniques, the sort of approach to printing and handmade paper, but you were literally imbuing narrative into the the very and make artist books as well, yeah. so yeah, and they've yeah. always gone hand in hand. Mm -hmm. But even I think your two-dimensional work 
yes. is holding narrative literally embedded in the paper itself, yeah. which I think is fascinating. So I wonder if, if each of you wouldn't mind talking briefly about beyond you know the specificity of paper, your relationship to the, the idea of the book, you know, the book form, and how you see that sort of translate across your practice. Um, well, I'll go back to your, um, the, the woven paper that I did, you know, with the paintings, the not so successful paintings that I cut up and um, started weaving, but there was content, there was content in the painting, and sometimes it was writing, um, a lot of collage work as well as paint. But the forms that I chose to weave them in were all based on traditional forms like um, Maori uh, plate baskets or um, Victorian um, handkerchief baskets or Philippine six-footed baskets, but um, I altered them in a way that they could be raw pieces and not um, functional. So um, they, they were non-functional but I felt like they were um, playing tribute to these um, craft forms, which I thought were really beautiful and sort of commingling um, that craft with uh, um, a, more, a more expressive art form. Um, but and in that way, to me, it told the story of the time and the people um, that those uh, traditions emerged from and then from there, it's, um, I think, and to me that held more content than my previous weavings, which were all very functional. Um, and then um, as I started um, working in cut work and, and handmade books, um, it just expanded the narrative. And, um, and I really, love the opportunity of having a medium where I'm really telling a story and even a personal story, not just someone else's honoring another person's story and time and history, but my own. Um, and I also, but I continue to really appreciate, you know, I feel like all of my work is based in craft and a lot of it tr traditional craft, like the cut works that I um, do in my books. Um, I was inspired by um, the Sheeran Snit of um, Switzerland and Eastern Europe, those um, traditional craft forms. And of course there's cut paper, you know, Lovely. beautiful cut paper in Mexico. Um, and I've always been drawn um, to that cut paper work, which is why I probably landed on it in the first place when I was trying to tell my own stories. Um, but I still feel like I'm drawing on a cultural traditions and a craft. And of course in the um, journals that I make are certainly um, using very old um, techniques and traditions, but I'm using um, my paste papers, which I feel like are very contemporary and personal um, to my work. This is my first time thinking of my work as a book, um, but I, I do think a lot of the importance of my work is from the content that it's holding, so I can see um, how it can be connected in that way. Uh, I am using a lot. I am using a lot of pages, um, so I guess that is another tie back to books. A lot of content is written on those pages. Um, I haven't read all of the paper that I have been gifted, <laughs> but I have read a few and it's, um, it's quite funny sometimes seeing like biology notes or other like study notes that people have written on even if, it, um, if it's not printed, sometimes people write handwritten messages on their, on their notes. Um, all the paper that I've been given has that history attached, whether or not I'm aware of exactly where it came from or um, some pieces I know exactly where it came from or who gifted it to me and I know the context um, but it's more taking all those memories that those pages had from their past life and then creating something new out of those um, and the tying the history of the golden venture folding technique itself is also something 
um, that's integral to my, my practice overall. You know, what Rosa said about, it, it kind of rang true for me about cutting up pieces and using those and weaving them. And I didn't really consider myself a book artist, uh, though I like to make books. You know, it's not really the focus of my practice, but I do make books all the time. And, and I would cut up prints that I felt were not successful, but I liked parts of them, you know? And so I'm, I was always saying, as you know, an instructor, save your work, you know, it tells you about your visual thinking, hold on to it, unless it's a total disaster. Because there might be something you like about it later, you know, so, so long as there's space permits you to keep things. But I do that with my prints, and I find components of them and make them into accordion books, and, um, uh, and like that, because it's, again, it's just reformatting things, and, and like I said, it, it tells you something about your visual thinking when you see things in a new uh, format. So uh, I always liked books. You know, I've taught uh, book arts for many years while I was teaching, and, um, and kind of make them on, as a side practice. So um, yeah, and my work is narrative. For a while, I was making work these big rectangular pieces that were you know, divide in half, half like the spread of a book, you know, the spread uh, of two pages and the relationship of the images. And so, you know, we kind of think about books a lot.